And we now have the ambassador um, to Germany from Taiwan joining us to discuss um, the Taiwanese model of democracy, what we can learn from it, um, and how the world can really improve um, based on these best practices. So thank you so much for joining us. My first question for you is, um, you know, a lot of people in the audience here are not necessarily aware of the Taiwanese struggle and the fact that democracy is actually fairly recent. Um, I think, you know, democracy started in the late 80s in Taiwan. So we were wondering if you could kind of let us know a bit about the recent struggle in Taiwan and, and what it means for today's democracy. Yes, uh, Colombia, I'm very much delighted and honored to be invited to take part on this telecommunication uh, conference. The key word, as I heard, is struggle. And the question you asked was, I think it was, uh, can you tell us uh, how the history of the Taiwan struggle? This word is interesting, struggle, because my father was a fisher. He was a fisherman. I, I was born and grew up on on in beside the in the neighbor of the water. When we speak of struggle, because struggle is the key word for the fate, for the for the for the history of Taiwan. When we speak of struggle, we can say uh, a fish struggles for survival when the water label drops in the lake. Oh when the fish was so was not careful enough, so he bite into the bait on the hook. He swallowed the bait. Then he fell for it. The fish fell for it. And then it means hook, line, and sinker. So we cannot allow it. We cannot afford such kind of mistake. As Minister Tom says that the freedom, the democracy, transparency, and so on is very, very significant for Taiwan. We have struggled to uh, get free, to get free of dictatorship in the, from 1949 to 1987. Uh, that's what, that's what, that were 38 years covered, Taiwan was covered with martial law. And martial law means no freedom of speech, no freedom of gathering, no freedom of region, and so on. So we struggled. We struggled for a life with dignity, with freedom of speech, with system, a political system where the opposition has a place to play. And it wasn't that easy because that was the Cold War. Chiang Kai-shek came from, to Taiwan from China, ran away from the communist uh, of uh, Mao Zedong, he came to Taiwan together with two million people. Uh, there were around 600,000 soldiers and the race were uh, professors, students, uh, farmers, and so on. So Taiwan was covered then with martial law. And before that, Taiwan was covered for 50 years from 1895 to 1945 for 50 years was covered as a colony by the, Japan, by the Japanese empire. So we have together almost a whole century. In the first part of the century covered by a colony uh, regime and for 38 years uh, covered by our own government but with martial law. So nearly 100 years, 19 years, we were struggling for a better life, for a life without, without uh, tyranny, let's just say that. And first of all, we have to be strong in two, in two aspects. We have to be strong in the aspect of economy, and we have to be strong in military. And in both aspects, the support and the aid of the Americans, USA, were very important and crucial. We, at the first, at the first place, Taiwan was an agricultural country, and we started to, we start with the uh, industrialization. And during around twenty or thirty years, 
we managed we managed to step out of this agriculture into economic with producing uh, for example, radios or electronic articles, or even shoes and uh, gift articles for for Christmas. So we were struggling very hard to have a better life because we know economic can stabilize, good economic stabilize the society. But on the other way, there was also an, an unbroken strait from China, from the Communist China, from the PRC. They tried to, many times they tried to take over Taiwan with military. And we were strong enough, but of course, with support of, uh, of the US Army, we managed to stay independent until now. And when the movement for democracy started, at the late 70s, because Chiang Kai-shek died 1975, four years before 1970, four years before he died, Taiwan was kicked out of, of the United Nations. That was 19, uh, 1971, to be exact, to be precise, that was the 25th The connection seems to be cutting. Um, can you all tell me if you hear me uh, or if you hear the ambassador on the chat? It would be extremely helpful. OK, it looks like it had to drop for a second. Uh, it must be a connection issue. We'll try to resolve this uh, in the middle of such an amazing historical um, uh, lesson in a way. We really don't want to cut it short. So let us just try to get him back online. And I'll be back with you in just a second. So you should be back normally, able to interact. I'm crossing fingers. <laughs> I think you have to unmute yourself and yes, I can hear you. I hear sound. Yes, you can me now. You can hear me now. Yes, I can't see you yet, but I can hear you. Okay, so I uh, continue. Uh, okay. Anyway, after after around forty years of martial law in nineteen eighty-seven. Uh, no, sorry, in 1987, yes, the, the, the martial law was lifted. One year later, the son of Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Jingguo, passed away. And a new president, Li Denghui, who was born in the colonial time of Japan, who was the first, who was the first chairperson of the KMT, who was born in Taiwan and did not come from China. Okay, so as you mentioned, I hope you can hear me. As you mentioned, yep. democracy is fairly recent. You have gone and you used the word struggle and explained its meaning for um, a century of struggle without freedom um, to get where you are today as a country. And it is, I think, inspiring for the whole world to see the vibrant democracy that Taiwan um, has. Um, I wanted to mention to mention something that we discussed. Oh, sorry, we can see you now. Can you hear me? Okay, you can. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Your camera seems to be going on and on. Yes, I can hear you. So, uh, as I was saying, you mentioned that. Um, okay, the okay. Sorry. Yeah. The struggle okay. has long. Um, I wanted to say that. It, sorry, go for it. The struggle for freedom, yeah, the struggle for freedom of Taiwanese people has a long history. 
uh, nearly one century, we struggled for our freedom, for our democracy then. And meanwhile, one thing very significant has changed. That is the identity, the identity of Taiwanese. Until 1987, we were educated, well, uh, before 1945, the Taiwanese people were educated as Japanese. They learn Japanese, they go to Japanese school, they go to even to Tokyo or Kyoto to study and so on. They were educated in the primary as Japanese Taiwanese. And then Jiang Kai-shek came 1945 and we were re-educated again. We were overnight, we were not Japanese anymore, we were not Taiwanese anymore, we, were, we became Chinese until 1987. And meanwhile, all the Taiwanese people have been asking themselves what we are. The ident identity of the Taiwanese people has been a question. Before that, we were not allowed to talk about it, to think of it. But now, together with, together with the, the democ democratization, the identity, a so-called Taiwanese uh, identity, was born. And that's the second part of the struggle. Where, where, when, uh, at, at the time when the Taiwanese the identity was there, there was also a question about who we are and what part of role should Taiwan play around in the world, in front of China, uh, beside our neighbors, in front of the Americans and so on. So we started to question this concept of the one China policy, because the one China policy was a product of the Cold War. The one China policy was the consensus, not between the Taiwanese people and the Chinese people, but between the Chiang Kai-shek regime and Mao Zedong's regime. During this, uh, during the 35, 38 years of, of martial law, we were not allowed to talk about this question. But now we are, since we are, we we, we do have now a, a democracy since 1987, and 10 years later, 15 years later, people who was born after the Cold War started to identify themselves themselves as the Taiwanese. And so the so-called one China thing, the one China policy, which means both China, one is PRC, People's Republic of China, and the other one is Taiwan, Republic of China. Both have the consensus, there's only one China. Either this one China or that one China is the legitimate stakeholder of the whole China. And everyone claims that they are presenting the whole China. And that means, in this case, Taiwan is always a part, a subject of this consensus and not a, a playing part, not, not, uh, not the main role we are given to the ambitions of two Chinas. And since we know that we are not, we are not the, as I say, we are not, uh, we, are, we are not representing the whole China. We are not re representing Tibet. We are not re representing Xinjiang. We are not re re representing Hong Kong. We are representing, and that's the so-called uh, paradigm change. We are representing the freedom, the democracy, the democracy. So for us, it's important to keep our democracy and freedom unharmed by the communist China. And that's the reason why we used to say that we are Taiwan and we are not China. And that's the reason why we are supporting the people in Hong Kong, we are supporting the people in, in, in Xinjiang, the Uyghur, the Tibet, and even the dissidents of China, we are supporting them 
not because we think China belongs to Taiwan and all these people belong to our Republic of China. No, it's not the case. We support them because we regard ourselves as the tower, light tower of freedom and democracy in the, in the uh, society of Chinese culture, let's put it this way. So we became an enemy. We became the enemy of the communism in Peking. We are uh, always, that's the reason why we have been always confronted by the straight military straight of China. And the reason why, why we are standing there is because A, we have support from the USA. Because the USA is, uh, is obligated to deliver Taiwan with sufficient and to defense weapons, according to the so-called uh, Taiwan Relations Act, that was 1979. And the other reason is because we have support, but more or less moral support from Europe, from the EU, from, from Japan, from Australia, and so on, and so on, from the world of freedom. And they know that we are we are the token. We we should stay there. We cannot be defeated because if we fell down, if Taiwan fell down, and that would mean the democracy in Asia or in in the Chinese culture society has no place. And until now, we have managed to what communist the communist regime in Peking always claimed, nam namely that. Uh, the human rights, such like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of gathering, gathering, are not compatible to the Chinese culture, to the Chinese culture. That's not right. Because we make it. We do we are practicing this democracy every day. So just like the uh, uh, minister old 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 just just mentioned, this democracy, this this democracy and this freedom of speech and so on is the antidote of the virus. The antidote, the efficient antidote of virus is not some medical. The most efficient antidote of, of the antidote is our freedom, our democracy. That's extremely well Can you put. Hear me now? Oh. Yeah, yeah, completely. We heard the whole thing. I think the, you know, you recap of the history of Taiwan. Thank you for doing this because it's, I think it should be an inspiration for many places struggling to achieve democracy, how this struggle has really brought about a very vibrant um, strong and healthy democracy in, in so few years. I mean, it hasn't been that long of a time. You said it started in 1987, which is very recent. Um, you mentioned Hong Kong. And for us, that's one of our big questions because we started a campaign um, to push big democracies to ally and impose sanctions on Chinese officials responsible for big um, human rights violations. Our question has always been, you know, China has been cracking down on various people over the last decades, over the last even further than decades. Um, it's been Tibet, then the Uyghurs, then Hong Kong. Um, does this worry you for Taiwan's future? Do you, is it a big worry in Taiwan? For example, last week or two weeks ago, I saw that there were um, airspace violations by China. How do you look at this with the future of Taiwan? Yes, of course, we are very much worried. Uh, let's say not only about Taiwan, but also Hong Kong, but since when the Hong Kong was given back in the year 1997, based on the contract between China and the UK in 1984, it was said in two ways. First of all, uh, it should be a model for the future of the fate of Taiwan. One country, two systems. One country, two systems. The Chinese government said that with proud. And it should be a solution for the future of Taiwan, or for the so-called unification uh, of Taiwan to China. But as we followed 
step by step, we, 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 as we found very close what has happened, not only since the last year, but since the last two decades, we have noticed that the human rights is a universal human rights, and it was guaranteed in the in in the contract in 1984, which, uh, by the way, this contract was, has been sent to UN. So it was an international important significant contract and the promises made by the Peking government should be held. And what happens in the last 20 years, not only last years, the freedom of speech, the press freedom has been taken away slowly, slowly, step by step, just like salami. Just a salami technique, step by step, little by little, all of this uh, human rights has been taken away. And what happened in the last year until today, it was not a salami tactic, it was a sashimi tactic. You know sashimi, the Japanese raw fish, they eat the raw fish, sashimi, you don't cook it, you just put it in the mouth. And what That's they have crashed on with police, and I think there were also a secret, secret uh, agents coming from China over to Hong Kong. And as we have known, we have read, we have seen in, in, in the social media and so on, a lot of young people he, who went on the street and then they were found died. They were dead in the, in the water. So we have been very worried about Hong Kong and of course today Hong Kong, tomorrow, Taiwan. The problem is Paul, uh, Hong Kong is still, according to my opinion and to my judge, Hong Kong is still, be, still to be rescued as long as not only the USA, not only the Japan, not only UK or Australian, but the whole world of the freedom, and that's included, that incorporates uh, uh, the EU, let's say, German, France, Italian, and Spain, and so on, and so on. That's the, the traditional countries who have always pointed it out that the human rights is the, the core is the heart of the of 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 the the, the of the importance for today. So we are supporting also Hong, some Hong Kongese who were running away, who were, were running the front from 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 China. Uh, there are some already some measures has been taken has been taken by our government. We have put our uh, we have. The Ministry of Inner Inner Ministry, we have the Ministry for China Affairs, and we have also some uh, NGOs with budget from the government has been settled on to support the Hong Kongese people. And there are, has been done something has been done, but we cannot we we cannot we cannot uh, put it in the in in, in the public. Is still it should be kept a secret till now because we are we are afraid that the Chinese government will do something if they know the way and the route how we support the Hong Kong people. Of course there must be a lot has been has to be done uh, if we want to support Hong Kong. But I think first of all is the Western the Western the EU they have always kept in mind that they are capable of telling the Chinese government that they do not agree. They will, they will, uh, they will tell the Chinese government that the world of the Western, we cannot accept what they are doing and what has done to the Hong Kongese people. Yeah, I think there's a national security law. To jump on, we got a few questions on Facebook on this. Um, you know, the Chinese foreign minister was doing okay. his yeah. European tour um, recently and passed by your by the country in which you're serving right now, Germany, um, also in my home country, France. 
And we have seen often a, a quite weak response from European leaders um, in pressing the Chinese yeah. foreign minister on human rights violations. For example, in Germany, I think that um, you know Germany condemned uh, the authoritarianism but boosted trade ties, which is a very mixed signal. Um, what do you think yep. should be done to stop China's authoritarianism? What do you think we need to do to stop also the expansion of the authoritarianism through the Belt and Road Initiative and so on? Also, vous êtes de la France. The, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Germany have been working very closely with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the France. And there are already there are already some movements which has been the measures has been taken to tell China that we that the Western cannot accept. The first thing they can be do, they do is to take a, an example on the USA what they have done. And that means to stop to stop uh, cooperation with China in some fields. To, and you have to do that together. Germany and France, and if it, is, it would be better, Germany and France and UK and USA. They can put China, uh, that's called a ban over China in different aspects, economic, military weapons and so on. And if we don't, if you don't do that, I think it doesn't matter us that much what do you do? Something has to be done. But important is it should be done under the, under the cooperation together with all the EU countries and across the Atlantic Ocean. For example, I think only one statement, one statement uh, together with all these countries, that, as I said, Germany, France, and, and, and uh, the EU countries and USA, and Australia and even one statement together pointing out that we cannot accept what you are doing to hundreds of people, pull back the national security tool for Hong Kong, and the postponed election, community election should be held on uh, as, as scheduled. And if they don't do it, if this China does not listen to that, then this still once it can be done. And the German has already declared that in the just published to the public the, the guideline of the Indo-Pacific. And that means the expansions politic of China in South China Sea or even I can say in Hong Kong and toward Taiwan. They are going to be uh, confronted with the practical measures of the yeah of, of military of militaries from USA from the EU uh, from the other the ten countries of Asia from Japan and so on the so-called Indo-Pacific Strategic Intelligence uh, Alliance and all of that if it sounds together then I think it doesn't matter that much that's for the first step show show uh, show pigeon the decision of all these countries together that Peking know that he that they will be confronted not separately with USA on the other side and you uh, German on the other side and maybe France or UK on the other side Peking would be confronted of an alliance of EU and Japan and ASEAN countries and USA and of course Taiwan too. And I think that that would be efficient enough. There will be a really warning signal, signature for signal for Beijing. Then people can think what they can do. Of course, there are some embargoes can be enforced to push China back. The problem is if people are afraid uh, getting into conflict with China, then all these countries of the free world can be bitten by Peking 
one by one. Together we are strong. And when I say together we are strong, I don't mean only uh, USA together with Japan, Australian, Indian, and and the EU. I also mean together we are strong, separated, we are weak. I also mean Taiwanese people, Hong Kongese people, the Chinese dissidents, the Chinese civil society who have been, also has been struggling, struggling uh, for their freedom, civil civil uh, freedoms and so on, together with Tibet and Uyghur. And that's what I have been doing in the last four years uh, since I came here representing Taiwan. I've been working quite, I've been in very close contact with Chinese dissidents, with Uyghurs, with Tibet, and in the last months, in the last year, since now, very close contact, I stayed with the Hong Kong people. I think as long as we do, we do that and we show it to the public, then Peking would fear us. Peking would fear us. On the contrary, they will fear us and we are not afraid of Beijing. Tell them that, tell them and show them we are not afraid of them and we are willing to work together, the civil society and the countries. I couldn't agree more. This I is I have made myself clear. No, very clear. I think, you know, we're doing a full 14 hours event today on democracy and what keeps on coming back through all of the speakers we're having is the need to stand together, to stand united across the world, to make sure that we can protect yes. and promote democracy um, together. Because as you said, together we are strong, but yes. apart we are weak. And this is, I think, the bottom line. I think when you look at China's economic muscles, countries yes. are are scared to take action including my home country, in the face of such economic strength, yep. it's scary. But if you have major economic powers that are also democracies, so you mentioned EU countries, the US, South Korea, India, Australia, Japan, that unite and take coordinated sanctions, coordinated economic and diplomatic sanctions, then we can do something to protect Hong Kongers, to protect Uyghurs, to protect Tibetans, to protect yes. the world as a whole. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I can, maybe I can give you an example of what the USA has done. Can I continue? Yeah, go for it. Hello? Yes. Yeah, okay. I, about sanction, about sanction, uh, economic sanctions, for example, USA has managed to convince one of the best uh, semiconductor producer of Taiwan, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, who delivers in the last years the very significant, very important chips to Huawei. And the USA find out some way, I don't know the details, but they found out some way to convince the TSMC to move over to USA, stopping, stopping uh, de delivering the the important chips to Huawei to crash down to crash down Huawei. It's not because Huawei is big and strong. It's because Huawei behind Huawei stands the CP, uh, PRC. I need I almost said the CPR. Yeah, the PRC needs CPR. And this TSMC was important. Made this move to stop. I said again, I, uh, to stop delivering the very important chips to Huawei. And so I said TSMC, uh, as I said, means Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. In this case, TSMC means Taiwan stops missing China. And if all the world stops missing China, China will come back in a very humble manner and say to the world, please don't let me down. China needs your support. China needs to make business with EU, with Germany, with UK, with France, with, with Japan, with USA. And all the situation would be the other way around. China would know that because of its uh, 
expansionismus. He has become the public enemy. China, the China under the PRC has become the public enemy of the international society. And in this case, the real talk can start. Before that, if you make kowtow to China, if you kneel down to China, there won't be any chance to push them back. On the contrary, they will feel stronger because you showed your humble attitude. You showed you 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 lie down on on on, on the earth. You kneel down. So there is no chance to push them back. There is only one way to push China back. The only one way is to work together again to work together in economic field, in military field, NGO field, in diplomatic field. I think we are facing. We are facing in the last months. I would say in the months we are facing a new era. I will call that. PRC post new new world. That's um, okay. I, I love the acronym of you know, Taiwan will not miss China. Um, I think it's a very strong way of putting it. I think we have five minutes left before the end of the session, and um, some of the questions we got were linked. It's a bit outside of what we've been discussing, but to the pandemic, to COVID nineteen. So we've seen that Taiwan has been. Um, yep has been an example in a way on how to deal with COVID-19, um, both in terms of ensuring that there's no crackdown on yeah. rights, uh, you know, democracy and rights were not um, tightened yeah. up. Yeah, we did it. Yes, exactly. But then also, well, there's been other, other side of it, and this is the, that leads me to the question, which is, Taiwan has not been able to join the WHO. Taiwan has not been able to share its best practice, and it's, way of dealing with the pandemic at the World Health Organization, which in my opinion has been a huge shame because many countries would yes. have benefited greatly from having Taiwan input into the conversation. Um, so what would you tell the other countries that didn't stand up for Taiwan, that didn't decide to stand up to China and say, look, Taiwan has a place in the World Health Organization, we need Taiwan input and we need their advice. Can you hear me? Can you hear me by lobbying by the Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have been telling the people since I started to work four years ago as the representative of Taiwan in Germany, I've been telling the people not only to the German but to the other friends of EU that the reason why Taiwan wants to become a member of WHO is not that only we need WHO. It's because also I, we know WHO needs us because we can make contribution to tell people how we can condemn the virus, how can we condemn uh, the pandemic, like, like malaria or something. We can also make our contribution. And the reason why we have been always excluded is unfortunately a political reason. And that's why I would say if WHO under the manipulation of China, keeps Taiwan outside the international society for WG, for for the common health is an action of suicide. Is an action of suicide. But who is going to die? Not the Chinese Communist Party, but the people, the citizens, the inhabitants of the world outside. So. We have now again experienced this fatal mistake. It should not be repeated again. And I think if, again, if EU, the EU has been supporting Taiwan generally uh, by we, our attempt to take part uh, on this WHA, not WHO, WHA, as not even a member, but as an observer. EU has been supporting Taiwan, like Americans, like the Japanese, but 
I'm sorry, I have to say that I'm not, it's not that I'm not thankful, I'm thankful, but I would tell the world, if you really want to get one into WHA or WHO, because you do care for the life of your, of your citizens, of your inhabitants, you have to be stronger by supporting Taiwan. You have to not only tell China, don't tell the WHA, don't tell the WHO, the terror, they are puppet, they are hand puppet, they are married. I'm sorry, I have to say that. They listen only to the Chinese government and tell China, if you don't let Taiwan in, that would mean you are harming us. You are not only excluding Taiwan from taking part in this WHO or WHA or even UN. You are, it says, homicide. You are harming us. You have this, you got to have this feeling. You are, you are not, uh, I'm sorry again, but you are not supporting Taiwan because you want to support, in, you want to support in Taiwan. You are supporting yourself. That's the reason why you have to support Taiwan. And I would like to say something about the reason why we didn't have to, we don't have to uh, uh, shut the aspect. We paid a great price for that. I would like to remind all of you on the year 2003, 2003, that was the year of SARS. In that year, Taiwan was completely unprepared. And after six months of this SARS, all around the world, the number of the deaths was around 500. I think it was around 483 or 87. You know, one tenth of less victims of SARS were Taiwanese. One tenth. And this time, we are the infection case, we are keeping it under 500, and the death is uh, seven. And this bitter, this bitter uh, experience of the SARS night in, in year 2003, we told us from now on, we have to take care of ourselves. You cannot depend yourself, you cannot depend on the support from the outside. It's, it would be nice, but in the first place, we have to take care of ourselves. So we built up a warm system shortly after SARS, and that was also uh, still in the year 2003. We built up an early warm system, and we have made use of this warm system in the last years, not only for, for pandemic. And secondly, we know if China isolated Taiwan, if, ta if China uh, uh, stops any aid and support from WHO, that's what has happened in the year 2003. And you know, time is not only money. Time is not only money. Time is life. So at the very beginning, we were very careful about what we have heard in the social media in China. So we started to get us prepared already in the end of the last year, in December, and in January, in February, in March. We have already done what has been done later on in May, in June, in July, in Europe, in some other countries. I'm not blaming the other countries for being not prepared. I'm just saying the reason why we have prepared us earlier is because the, we, we are aware of our isolation, isolated uh, uh, situation. And secondly, the democracy, the, the democracy of Taiwan is in this case very stable. It grounds on the base of the bilateral trust between the government and the civil society. And the third part is our industry. Our entrepreneur, they work very closely to get with our government, with NGO, with the civil society. So that network of combating, fighting against virus could be, could be, could be, uh, could be done, could be set up. And we are 
we are fortunate. We feel sorry for the country. We feel sad. These who have suffered under this pandemic. And that's the reason why we also donated uh, millions and millions uh, masks to the countries, also to Germany, to France, to the EU, to USA, and so on, where we think we should make the feedback. And it, 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 would, it, would, it would be quite, quite a pity that Taiwan uh, is still be excluded from from the meeting of WHO in September. Yeah, that's very true. That would be a shame. If after all, that would be the shame that Taiwan should be excluded again in the in in in, in the WHA in September. I hope exactly the we whole world can recognize. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I'm sorry to have to interrupt you. We but we are running late think, on the next session. But on those wise, wise words, I think it's a call for all of the activists no that are problem. following us to stand up as well with Taiwan, to make sure that they make their voices heard, to say that Taiwan needs to be part of the World Health Organization, needs to attend the World Health Assembly, that we can learn from Taiwan. And not doing so, as you said, is not only a shame for principles, but it's putting all of our lives in danger. And it is criminal to do so. Um, so thank you so much for participating. I'm really sure, sorry. You are definitely to... right. Yeah. Yeah. We could keep on going for hours, um, but it's been extremely, um, I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. for all of us. Thank you so much, yeah, Ambassador. That was a great pleasure. Great. Um, for everyone else who's online, we will be back in exactly one minute. Bye.